Namaskaram and greetings from Indic Academy. This is uh, Parna Sridhar and it's a great privilege for us this uh, beautiful Bangalore Monday morning to speak to Dr. R. Balasubramaniam, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for making time and speaking to us about your latest book, The Power Within, The uh, Legacy of the Leadership of Sri Narendra Modi Ji. It's a great honor. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you. And thank you for our organizers and hosts also. So just to uh, go deep, dive into this book, um, it's wonderful that you're writing a management book with uh, Indic values being uh, right up front. There was a line uh, in the book which says that any vision has to come from within, which obviously uh, deeply inspires him, but also has to align with the context and situational realities prevailing in the ecosystem in which one operates. So you have set the stage for the ecosystem which has uh, supported Sri Narendra Modi ji's uh, rise. So what would you say is uh, this ecosystem all about? You know, uh, in the context of leadership, I would like to explain it in the context of leadership. So leadership traditionally uh, from a Western lens is always seen as a person with a lot of traits and behaviors. It's about the individual, you celebrate the individual, the leader and the actions he performs. But in, in, in a sense, it doesn't really talk about, uh, it doesn't focus a lot more on the actions, it's just about himself. And therefore, without followers in the West, the identification or the identity or affirmation a leader gets would be zero. Mm. Whereas in India, it's different. The Indic thinking is not about being the being the celebrated individual put on a pedestal. That's that's all later additions. But in reality, in India, if you look at it, it's about the actions a person performs. So it's, you celebrate the actions. But actions of whom? It has always to be in context, in the context of your ecosystem in which you operate. And civilizationally, uh, in the words of Swami Vivekananda, if he's, uh, the way he describes, he said, our country's focus and possibly the only civilization which focused so much was on a very important context. And just before that, also in the West, a leader is somebody who co constantly determines, controls or responds to the external ecosystem. So it's always the outside. Whereas Swami Vivekananda articulated it so beautifully. He said, we in India focused on not just control of external nature, but we dive deep within ourselves and the control of internal nature. And he says it so beautifully. He says, what's the point? Even that internal nature, he says, has to have a practical societal value. It, there's no point a monk sitting in the Himalayas meditating. He said, if he's of no use to the rest of the world. Yeah. And he uses this Vedic statement, Atmano Mokshartam Jagathitayacha. So he says the internal pursuit, the internal final purpose of mankind, of a man, if he's born as man, is to recognize the unification of the divine. So that is the experience of moksha. But moksha for, it's not just for personal for good. Own right? It has mm -hmm. to be for society good. So there has to be jagat sita also. So that is that is the context in which I write that where my way of looking at leadership is not about the leader, but it is the process of understanding yourself, the swadhyay. And understand who you are, why are you born, what are you doing, what are the contexts in which you are operating. And don't stop there and say understanding the other. And that is the external ecosystem in which you operate. All of us have micro ecosystems in which we are embedded. We are all, that's also embedded in a larger macro ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So understanding the other and more importantly, the actions the self performs for the others, the Jagat Hitha. But we should not lose sight of the final purpose of life itself. And that is, that is what I try to bring out. And I, that's why I explain leadership as a spirituality in action. Just so that people don't lose sight of all the Jagat Sita is okay, but that's not the ultimate. Jagat Sita is a means, but what we shouldn't forget is the Atmana Mokshartha. So, in your own um, personal journey, you you are uh, part of the uh, SEBI, uh, social uh, SEBI system, as well as in HR with the government. Uh, so, you must have had uh, close access to observing the Prime Minister. So, in your own work, how do you inculcate this? Actually, my journey for understanding leadership is not just all, all the roles that you're talking is very recent. Mm. But my real, uh, my real life's journey was with indigenous communities 40 years ago, living and working with uh, indigenous tribal communities. Mm. Started my career as a physician, so that gave me a different space. Mm. And in India, if you look at a doctor, it's a very hierarchical relationship. You don't go to a doctor seeing him as an equal. Mm. You always go to him as a deliverer of your problems. Mm. And it's a very nice egoistic space, you know, to tell people what to do. 
and how to take care of themselves. Uh, so my journey began from that space where I thought I have solutions to the world's problems. And when you go and work with indigenous tribal communities, you go with the mindset. Being born and brought up in Bangalore, mm -hmm. we think we have we have answers for everything, especially for the rural poor. Now that's the way in context in which all of us come up. So when I went, I was no different. But within a few years of my life there, I realized that um, these communities are so embedded with enormous wisdom. But typically, uh, mainstream societies, if you can call the rest of the world mm -hmm. that, uh, equate poverty with ignorance, equate poverty with all the problems of the world and therefore they don't see them as people with wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I made the same mistake. Mm -hmm. So within a year or two of my living with these indigenous communities, my interaction with chieftains there were traditional chieftains, not because of anything else but because they are embedded with the responsibility of leading their communities by legacy uh, mm -hmm. trans transfer of power that happens from the father to the son. And when I started interacting with them, I realized their knowledge of leadership was not only extensive, practical, but was driven by an underlying cause. And I, uh, one, one particular uh, incident that shaped my thinking was, I thought tribals are poor and so they need some, uh, uh, you know, interventions to make them better off. Mm. It was, a, it was a for, for elephant area, obviously it's a project uh, tiger and project elephant area where I went in the original Kedda space, that is where I was living. So I thought we should now grow something which elephants will not destroy. Mm. And so I told the tribals, let's grow a crop which elephants don't even know about. Mm. So we hit upon cabbage. Mm. A cabbage was not something known to the tri uh, elephants at that point of time. So we grew cabbage and luckily that year the elephants did not attack the cabbage mm. farms. We had a bumper crop. So I used, I thought let's go sell it in Mysore, but I did not know the mafia of how this marketing happens in agriculture produce. It's a mafia. Only one guy will buy cabbage, one guy will buy onions, one guy will buy uh, potatoes and they'll buy it in the middle of the night. That's how the mm. markets operate in uh, any any urban area. So I took all the cabbage in a big truck, went down to the market, my colleague friend took it to the truck and there we realized that that fellow was, and previous week I had checked up to 6 rupees a kg mm. in the market. Mm. So I thought my tribals are going to hit a bonanza now. <laughs> the fellow offered me 30 paise a kg. And we had no choice, either dump it in the middle mm -hmm. of the road or come back. And my tribal friends told me, why dump it? Let's donate it to all the mm -hmm. uh, Anath Ashramas and come back. Even there, they had that sense of giving. But we sold it to cover our diesel cost, came back. I was very disappointed. The elderly chief in Kempaya, he came and met me and I said, why are you so depressed? I said, see, I couldn't get returns. And Kempaya's statement was not just sucker to me, but it was his way of life. He said, why are you you're looking at the crop? I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. You are trained to measure it with money, but try looking at the crop as extraordinary act of God. You throw a seed mm -hmm. and in front of your eyes you see God creating and you could never have seen God's creation any other way. And then why bother? You've seen God's creation. Just let it go. No, possibly you can't explain Karmanya Vadika Raste better than this. Just let it go. Why are you bothered? Enjoy that and just leave it there. Mm -hmm. So in one stroke he took away the whole, the, he at least brought in me the concept of doership and enjoyership in a beautiful way, which is both not mine. Mm -hmm. And he said, we are all instruments, farmers are instruments of God participating in this creation and a tribal telling me this. So it hit me then that indigenous wisdom was so much and there is something I can learn from this and that's how my journey began. And now 30, 40 years fast forwarding, I, I started, uh, my, my journey also took me to Harvard to understand leadership. I thought I can get it there. Then suddenly struck me all this wisdom was a real knowledge, not what I was getting from degrees and qualifications. But three years ago, uh, the Honorable Prime Minister appointed me to the Capacity Building Commission, which is a commission, actually it's called Mission Karmiyogi, mm -hmm. where the, for the first time the government uh, thought it, it's important to make a bureaucracy future ready, but not just with skill sets that have the mindset of a karma yogi. So the mandate given to us is how do you elevate them from a karmachari to a karma yogi, which is possibly a fascinating challenge to operate with. Mm. And that's how we started. And uh, since we report to the Prime Minister, we could understand his mind, his thinking. And for writing this book, I had several conversations with him, which gave me opportunity to understand him from a different perspective. You know, people on the outside uh, have lenses, mm. either they are so-called bhakt and admirers, and they have one lens, the critics have another lens. Uh, and the more closer I got to him, seeing him in action, uh, I was also falling into the trap of becoming an admirer because he's worthy of admiration. 
So I had to put on my lens of uh, uh, or wear the hat of a academic, mm -hmm. try to maintain intellectual objectivity to the extent I could and study his life for 50 years. Mm -hmm. So right from his 17th year and two years of his traveling around India to being a Pracharak, to being a, a organizing secretary to the BJP, to being a, a chief minister of Gujarat and then the prime minister of the last 10, 11 years, 11th year now. So I had this privilege of studying it. But what I had done much before was trying to understand the leadership that Indian scriptures talk about. So I used them as a filter, used my experiences, observation and research of what he, what I was observing and tried to see the, he, how much of it he embodies and a substantial part of it he was embodying. So I thought let me use him as a life and uh, flesh example. Now, we all talk of people, we always talk of people in the past. Uh, you must be like Rama or operate like Yudhishthira. But for so many of them, it's just a story. You can't relate to them. But if you take a real life example in the current contemporary scene, whose life struggles can take a young boy selling tea on a railway platform to becoming the prime minister of a complex, diverse country like us, with all the political barriers you have winning elections, I thought that's a story to be told. So that's how this emerged. And uh, it's more, it's mostly a book on Indic leadership, using him as a case study to explain how it plays out. It's very well uh, written, sir. And uh, the starting itself uh, with the concept of uh, Raja Dharma, which is uh, based on the Shanti Parva of the Mahabharat. So, to go back to your rural experience, you say the footprints of all other animals are subsumed by the elephant. So, all other dharmas are subsumed by uh, Raja Dharma. So, this concept of Raj Dharma, uh, is it articulated in several texts or how do we get to them? It's actually, uh, if you, uh, strangely, if you look at it, both Ramayana and Mahabharata describe it. Mm. Kautilya obviously in Artha Shastra describes it and each of them have a different way of looking at it. The most valid, contextually relevant, culturally appropriate way is what I have tried to bring out in the book, the 10 tenets of Raja Dharma. Uh, you know, Yudhishthira is having a conversation with Bhishma and Bhishma is on the bed of arrows and is advising and Yudhishthira says, now I have to, I have to rule now, now it is all settled now and so how do I rule and that is when Bhishma advises him. That is something that everybody knows. But what a lot of people don't know is in Ramayana, we celebrate Rama as an individual. We rarely we see him as Rama as the king. Yeah. He is he's known for the you know, perfect uh, individual or the you know, the perfect Purusha you can meet and all that. But when, when he uh, goes into exile and uh, coronation is done, but he goes into exile, at that time Bharata is to take over. And Bharata says, I am not going to rule. We should also appreciate Bharata. He is insecure, he is tense. He is unsure of being a ruler, he is unsure of uh, taking on his brother's role and he is also ill prepared. That is mm -hmm. also the truth mm -hmm. and that is so beautifully described by Valmiki. Yeah. He rushes to Rama and says, you know, I can't do this. Uh, he says, you were trained, you were cor uh, coronated, you were meant to be the mm -hmm. uh, king. So everybody prepared you, you mentally prepared yourself, society prepared itself, but I am not. Mm -hmm. They won't even accept me, I am not ready. So tell me what should I do in your absence? I'm going to keep your paduka. You are ruling, but how should I rule? Mm -hmm. This the, those two beautiful concepts. One is your representative of something, somebody. Now in a democracy, our parliamentarians are representing the real rajas, the people, and they also need to remember yeah. that. So Bharata is like that. But then Rama describes to him eloquently how you should rule his country, mm -hmm. how you should do it. How should you look at the poor? How should you look at the uh, tra uh, travelers? How should you look at the his own, his own uh, the, the council of ministers and how, what kind of council you should take and accept and how should you validate it. From that to saying that how should trade happen, how should commerce happen, how should you respect your traders because they are important to sustain the economy. So it is a beautiful conversation where he describes Raja Dharma in a very nice practical way. And then Arthashastra obviously uh, sort of is a masterpiece in describing how it should be done. So I think uh, for, for in Arthashastra it, it, it captures it simplistically. And he connects it to the ruler mm. in a different way. Uh, Chanakya says the mandate of the ruler is only two things. He is very clear. Uh, whereas in Bhishma gives 10 tenets mm. for Raja Dharma, here he says only two things, Loka Sangraha and Yoga Kshema. And he is very clear about it. Mm. And he says Loka Sangraha is this welfare of all the people you rule. Yoga Kshema is a powerful concept. In that one word, it is it's about providing securities to whatever you have acquired and whatever you intend to acquire, which means emotional security, social security, fiscal securities, all kinds of securities. It's the responsibility of the king. Yeah. But for that, he says, 
there is the obligation of the king to conduct himself in a particular way. And he says the real person who can deliver these two, and that's when you call it dharma of the raja, yeah. is indriya nigraha. Unless you attain indriya vijaya, the control of your senses, you cannot deliver yoga kshema and loka sangraha. And so I think all of them would say the same thing, but in different contexts, different ways. And I have tried to integrate that. Yeah. Though I haven't brought Ramayana's lecture into this because it confused the reader also. So I just brought the concept and put it yeah. into it. Thank you for uh, sharing that. You uh, also say that the ruler must develop the qualities like control of Indriyas, but you also say that they must develop qualities of a Rishi or a Seer. So uh, Yoga Kshema comes into it. So uh, what what are these qualities? Is it possible to live in this material world with all the political rivalry, chaos, corruption and still uh, let that uh, lamp of uh, saintliness be inside? Is it a practical? I think it is. I think that's the only practical mm -hmm. way. Because if you allow the noise to distract you, you get distracted, you get carried away, you can't deliver. And that is where I think Prime Minister Modi is a very good exemplar. Uh, I'll give five or six things which are very critical for a ruler, which he embodies and which is able to carry on. The first thing is you obviously have to have a vision. You know, and uh, vision has to be something beyond yourself. Vision is not about me or my life. It's about, it's not, it's not in a very selfish way. The Niswartata of Seva. So, Vivekananda says it again beautifully. He says two national ideals, Seva and Tyaga. And if you look at Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, preparing yourself for the spiritual journey, whether it's Yama, Niyama and all that. All that is very integral to the qualities of a person, okay, just any, any seeker, but especially a space where you are in, impacting lives of millions of people. Mm -hmm. So, this focus on his purpose, the cause that he has taken up. And again, Swami Vivekananda says it again beautifully. He says, take up one cause and one cause alone. He says, breathe it, live it, sleep on it and then enormous power will generate. That's the power within I described, the dynamo inside you. For Narendra Modi, the one purpose was Rashtra Seva. And he has kept it. That's what I see 50 years of research. That's consistently common. It's different ways it expresses. As a Pracharak, Rashtra Seva means one thing. As a chief minister, it means another thing in the context of your state. As prime minister, it means something else. Now, as a global leader, it means something else. Others, he wouldn't worry about supplying vaccines free of cost to 40 nations which needed it at a particular time or the International Solar Energy Alliance and stuff like that. So, expanding your role, but his purpose has not altered. So, that single-minded pursuit, it's celebrated throughout. The second thing is, and I write about it also, and uh, in the foreword, Nitin Oriya writes about that uh, Vedic statement where, you believe in something, you say, this is my purpose, this is my, uh, the reason why I live and you keep focusing on it, that becomes your destiny. And I think that's a very great, uh, standing out example for Prime Minister Modi. The second thing is, there are a lot of distractions. It's very easy to get distracted from the work at the center. Real, real uh, control of the mind is staying focused on what you started out on, which we don't appreciate. Mm. If I'm talking this conversation, that focus is giving my 100% to this conversation and not getting distracted with how will it turn out, will people like it, will people even watch it, what will be the hits, what will be the likes in today's world of social media. But giving myself with my completeness to this, with neither the pressure of the past or, or the fear of the future of acceptance of the future. Now, Prime Minister Modi operates absolutely in the present. And when you're talking to him or when you're interacting with him, he cannot be distracted. He gives his 100% so completely that he doesn't forget a conversation, forget not just an idea is presented to him, he doesn't forget a conversation with whom he had. Mm. He meets tens of people a day and in his uh, busy life, he might meet hundreds of people in a week and still he can remember which conversation with whom, mm. what purpose and recall it when he meets you next. Mm. He could say that, okay, 40 years ago, I came to this village, this man is a thick mush uh, in Himachal Pradesh, Anurag Takurji narrated it to me and I have not mm. mentioned it in the book and he could describe him and say, he gave me this roti, it was mm. very tasty. You know, this kind of, that comes because your 100% is the moment of time. So, the power of now, which Eka Tolle describes and what all of us in the Gita is all about that, living the present with that, that, that enormous, uh, you know, that the Ekatvam is also there, the Samatvam is also there. Displaying that every day, all the time, you are insulated from the outside noise. So, to me, once you have that, Sita Pragnate comes. A political leader, a public leader is going to be appreciated, is going to be criticized. And I think today in the in the global scenario, uh, Prime Minister Modi's 78% approval rating is very nice. But that 78% is very quiet 78%. <laughs> but the loud decibel 
uh, rabble rousing 22 percent which is there it can be very dis yeah. disturbing like you know, even an ordinary person like me if i'm doing something and somebody comes into my office and says your report is bad or this is not good work you know, it takes a lo long time for me to recover from that right even if it's not a person of significance but here every day every morning from the streets to the parliament you're only screaming 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 and he has not lost sight of the fact that vikasit bharati mera sankalp hai you know very focused and saying that this is i want this uh, that again demonstrates the pragnate equipoise is nice to talk about or read in the gita but to live it every moment without getting distracted so i think these are some several several of the qualities that i find in him and more importantly uh, you know a public leader has to focus on the short term you got to win elections you got to promise all that you can give right at the same time very few public leaders in the world focus on the long term no we are in a moment of history where our head of government he's got this unique ability to balance and uh, reach a equilibrium equilibrium point where he can actually look at short termism because he has to become the prime minister yeah. first right to win an election mm. without losing sight of long termism yeah. so he can talk of 25 years amritkal mm. and 2047 bharat mm. at the same time win the election by yeah. saying okay i'll give you houses i'll give you toilets mm. i'll give you water now that's so beautifully pragmatic. brought out mm. pragmatic but it's brought out in our scriptural yeah. thinking ashrayas and prayers mm. right and you you have to think of shreyas and you have to think of prayers too mm. the long term in the shreyas and the prayers also mm. now you can and lot of people get carried away they think prayers is only enjoyment and short term and all that but okay we need the rice we need the water in the short term you can call it enjoyment but it's survival also the so long term and, and and again the beauty the way i see it i draw a lot of parallels from vivekananda and i quoted him a lot here uh is swami vivekananda says you can't teach bhagavad gita on an empty stomach mm. so you got to fill the stomach first you got to take care of your basic needs and uh, prime minister modi has done that whether you know you can ask why is a prime minister talking of toilets houses mm. food and all that right or giving 50 5 lakh rupees for health care uh, 60% of india gets the benefit now we can ask why but that is the sharirik seva you got to address it you can't lose sight of the bhautik seva like swami ji says you got to have the nep so the world mm. and finally you got to understand that all this is for something higher so in my last chapter where i write out the dharma of legacy and the legacy of dharma i bring in the purusharthas and uh, we were turning to his declaration in delhi the g20 declaration though it looks like a very nice slogan for peace mm. right people planet profits and peace the undercurrent is uh, entire purushatas bound together by dharma dharma is a cement that's holding it together and that can only come from a person who's living those values it's not just about talking those values so not getting distracted coming to your original thing staying focused on the work at the center and more importantly manifesting the communication i described with the sahardayata no sadharanikaran is a very powerful description i give of bharata's natya shastra but the underlying part of sadharanikaran is the bhava that comes out the context of in his case the ability to connect and stay connected at a very deeply emotional level so sahardayata leading to sahakaryata so he keeps saying team india for a new india but the driver is we need to connect we need to have that deep level of oneness and with that oneness generate the space of a uh, team which can deliver to the nation and all these are spiritual concepts absolutely sir in um, i hope we are not we have time because it's I, so interesting yeah. yeah even for uh, hanuman ji uh, he needed a jambavan to tell him what his ability is and what his capability so um, in the context of modi ji when he wanted to uh, become a sanyas but had to be told that by the swami ji of the ramkrishna mission that that's not your life goal so how did he accept that is there any like we may have a very strong feeling of what we want to be in life but somebody else a guru or a mentor tells us that that's not your life purpose how easy is that to accept it's not Hmm. from my own personal yeah. space uh, if i look at my own life my guru my diksha guru swami achalanand ji hmm. and i spent 5 years learning all the uh, scriptures from him hmm. and i was convinced that i have to become a monk hmm. so i went to him and said i also want uh, uh, give me sanyasa he said i can't give you anything it has hmm. to happen he said hmm. and then he said it's not in your destiny i thought this old man has gone berserk he teaches me for 5 years and hmm. says it's not for you he says your life is different and at that time you don't make sense uh i'm a happily married man i have a wonderful wife and son maybe my destiny was not that and he told me something very powerful he said 
to be a good householder and serve this nation is better than to be a bad monk hmm. or incomplete monk. Yeah. And he said, it's not for you. So at that point of time, I was irritated, upset and said, this man, what does he want? And all hmm. that. For Modi, it must have been much more amplified because he had gone around the place, he had gone to Belur Mat. There they told him, get it, you had to have a degree first. And you, at that time, you were not graduated yet. He was a 17 year old. And then they said, okay, they want me to get a graduation because Ramakrishna order, they say you have to join after graduation. So he thought he went back after graduation, but continued to be in touch with the Rajkot Ashram. Then he goes back to Rajkot Ashram and says, now I'm ready. Now I want to be a monk. So the fire and in his belly and his desire to serve as a monk was very deep. Atma Sananji was encouraging him in the pursuit of understanding himself. But when he said, I want to be a monk, he told him, no, you are not, it's not meant for that. You are, you are actually going to be a different kind of a monk. You know, essentially, he still lives a very monastic life, but in a different kind of a monk, but in the service of others. Uh, he might not have articulated saying you are going to be chief minister, prime minister and all, but in the service of others. And many later examples, I have heard very senior monks of the Swaminarayan group, of the uh, uh, other ashrams who have said that they have also had uh, their own ways of insight in looking that this man is destined for something else, that's destined for higher purpose. But Prime Minister Modi himself was very disappointed is what I believe and in one place I even write that. He says, very disappointed not being able to monk, he was trying to understand what else can he do. Because the desire to seek and know himself and God in that pursuit was very deep. So he writes, undecided, unclear, unguided, I was just going around. And then it comes to him that, okay, my life is about service. He had a crucible experience in his childhood to serve as a young child. I think that seed, that first spark suddenly became a flame and said, no, now I know, understand what it is. He also had the privilege of being mentored by Vakil Saab, uh, Inam, Inam Darji from uh, the uh, Sangh when he was a Bal Swayam Sevak. So I think all these things are there inside the seeds. When that uh, tipping point comes or the, when that critical uh, moment comes, it all falls in place. That must have happened to him. He was a little confused, unguided is what he says. But then he himself has said this in one interview and that's what I have quoted here. But then he says, okay, my, my, my journey is to serve and through that service discover myself. So finally, even what is monkhood? It's not just wearing the okra robes. It's also going deep into discovering yourselves. He has chosen the path of discovering himself to service of this nation and its citizens. I think that's also in a sense Absolutely. a sannyasa only. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, you quote uh, uh, one verse where you say there is no letter which doesn't have a charm, no root which doesn't have medicinal property. There is no person who is not able, but rare is the one who knows his or her proper application. So, when all of us are, does this imply that all of us are, uh, every uh, person is capable of being in a similar power situation. So every employee can potentially be that special leader. Uh, or is it that, you know, there are some who have that awareness of their own abilities, which takes them to, to play that role? See, it's in two different contexts we got to see it. Mm -hmm. From an emotional maturation concept, a heightened sense of self-awareness uh, also shapes how you express your purpose. At the same time, a heightened sense of self-awareness also clarifies purpose. A heightened sense of self-awareness prepares you for the purpose. In that context, I write. It's also about a set of qualities that you acquire and you know for yourself. You know, many of us, uh, in, in India, we talk of samarpan bhav, the surrender thing. It can sound very, uh, sort of an important, helpless kind of surrender where I just let go and say, I can't do anything about it. That is how the Western world would immediately say, because you're supposed to be in control, you're supposed to be the king and God and Lord and say, I can do what I want. But here we're talking of surrender. But the beauty of this surrender is not a helpless surrender. It is a surrender with the wisdom that there's a higher force which is uh, helping me manifest my inner self. So where you're surrendering yourself as an instrument of the higher force and not taking on the responsibility of being a doer, but allowing yourself to get done things done through you. And when you reach that state, that's a state where uh, you, you are willing to be that instrument. And that is the sense of purpose you get. That's a different level where it's devoid of selfishness. It's devoid of the transactional obligations of uh, existence. And that is a space I try to describe where uh, either through seva you reach that level. Through seva which becomes niswarth, you start making it a spiritual practice. So karma becomes karma yoga. 
and as you go deep into karma yoga you dissolve yourself into the karma and the yoga mm. and it, that says a oneness i think that is the journey and my way of looking at prime minister modi would be he's on that journey and that's what i'm trying to uh, create the foundation for that thinking yeah. you also uh, give a example for the sublimation of the ego when you talk about mount meru and uh, not everyone can scale you say mount meru it's only the chakravarti who has ruled and you know conquered the rest of the world which uh, modi ji i think has in many ways so you say the king bharata when he uh, climbs uh, mount meru and wants to put, put up his flag uh he's a, because he thought he's the first person to have done so but he sees there are many flags already there so while we, like you said the bhaktas of uh, modi ji i count myself as one see him as being one in a million who's come to rescue india for after a very long colonized uh, history but there are people who have already put the flag up there for us including uh, swami vivekananda ji so who are those significant others apart from vivekananda swami who have put that flag on mount meru for us i think i used that example in a different context uh, i'll i'll sort of clarify the context i used it it's a metaphor for something else mm -hmm. uh, it's truly a metaphor for uh, su uh, sublimation of one's ego or, or sub subsuming it into the larger context in which you operate see what happens when we are operating we forget we are the instrument and we start thinking we are the doer uh swami ji says uh, don't stand on a pedestal and say here my poor man take my 5 cents no and he explains it so beautifully he says a cow which give uh, gives birth to a calf knows how to feed it milk mm -hmm. so don't think that you are the doer yeah. things are already planned mm -hmm. you are just uh, be privileged that you are an instrument mm -hmm. i think many of us when we get down to this kind of work and i've had this in my own personal life too when you're working with tribals and people write about you they make uh, articles on you and then you start feeling oh i must be doing some great work after some time the work at the center which i spoke about in my case it was tribal development gets replaced with i must be seen to be doing tribal development mm -hmm. we have seen recent anti corruption movement which was a part of mm -hmm. fighting corruption was was the work at the center but suddenly it became i should be seen to be fighting corruption right and then you want to exploit mm -hmm. it that is the danger the bharata i described mm -hmm. no the whole metaphor is not the, see we get, let's not look at the story mm -hmm. mount meru is just the the challenge of yeah. transcending all this putting up the flag there is egoistic representation of i have achieved it i have conquered this i have come up there i have transcended all the problems and come there that is in a very physical vyavaharik sense and when you get there you realize so many others have conquered it what big deal but the real metaphor is not about conquering mount meru it is about conquering yourself and i brought it in the context because when i was doing my literature review and study and i was trying to combine western literature with indic thinking a very powerful book which is often used a very powerful book based on research like this is also based on research of a different kind that is a research of a different kind archie brown write, wrote a book called the myth of a strong leader where he analyzed the lives of five major leaders across the world mostly the west and russia including and he says it's a myth and it's a threat both so i used to wonder he is not analyzed anything in the east or anything in the global south but you come to one standard prescription and the whole world has agreed to it <laughs> so i started going deep into it that's when i realized the very metric of power and strength was like bharata climbing mount meru i have done it yeah. so that's all power without whereas indic knowledge and indic systems support power within and the control of power within the indriya vijaya that we talk about is the power within and is there somebody that i can analyze and write about who is the true conqueror of the mount meru but is inside us not outside mount meru and write about it it's a metaphor of subsuming aham transcending it so if you look at the prime minister his off quoted statement especially to people who work around him and close to him is main aham hmm. no do outside world can project it the way they want like they would always see the bharata hold the flag and they want to be the bharata with the flag so they're jealous and they make their own statements hmm. but what they don't see is a journey the determination the discipline to conquer the aham in the inside and i think that's what i was trying to refer to in that example sure i just took my own now uh, yeah. this of it sir uh you also quote uh, mark twain where you say uh, you know two most important days in our life are uh, the day we are born and the day when we come to know our purpose so is that you know suddenly some kind of an epiphany that happens or uh, is the you know is it something that i can make a sankalpa and get it done 
that would be a little lesser. Mm. See, uh, the power of reflection, which again, which is what our scriptures are very strong about. Everybody talks about a Gurukula system today and the repetitiveness of mantras, etc. But that is just one means. If you look at India, our education system was driven by repetitive thinking and reflective thinking. It is a perfect combination of both. So you have to reflect, you have to think through it, analyze it, absorb it, apply it in practical life and come back and validate it with your own experimentation. That is the space our education system gave us in a traditional past. Now, in this context, when Mark Twain says it, it's in a context, but what I try to say is every one of us has some crucible experience in life. You, me, all of us. Most of us don't reflect on the experience. So, it just becomes a data point for us. You know, this happened when I was 7 years old. This happened when I was 10 years old. If we spend time reflecting on that, that becomes an experiential appreciation. Then it gradually evolves into wisdom with repeated experiences or applying it in real life. Now, those crucible moments happen to all, but very few of us make it a crucible moment. It's, an, it's a moment. Mm -hmm. So, for Modi also, he had a crucible moment. Uh, and when he was a child, you know, in his own village, uh, his neighbor had, uh, there were a couple which didn't have a child and they're longing for a child for a long time and they had a baby after a long time. So, the whole village celebrated. Mm -hmm. And for Modi, it was quite an amusing thing. The whole village is celebrating some one house. Today, you don't even have that, right? If you have a birthday party, four people you'll invite. Mm -hmm. You don't want others who are not invited to come in. Mm -hmm. So, we plan who should not attend rather than who should attend. Mm -hmm. But in a communitized setting like a village, it's different. So, within a week, that joy turned into sorrow because a child died. Mm -hmm. And this family was shattered. This family had a cow. And they brought it. And the cow, the, when the baby died, stopped eating. So, this baby, child Narendra couldn't understand. He goes to his father says, what is it? What happened? And the father explains, possibly, possibly it's the cow's way of grieving. The fa cow was part of the family. It's seen as a family member, brought up as a family member. So, it's also grieving for the child which died. So, Narendra is all this is funny and always skeptical also, right? And at 7 or 8, you're all, you can believe at the same time, you're also doubtful. But after a week, the cow also died. And uh, for Narendra Modi as a child, this is a very crucible moment. For him, it hit him and said, if a animal can grieve so deeply and so strongly and feel so much for human suffering, how much more stronger should I as a human being feel for another human being suffering? I think that was his crucible moment and if you look at every concept of seva he is built up, has to be for the other. Mm -hmm. So, whether he talks of Anthyodhya, whether he talks of Vishwakarma, whether he talks of sending vaccines to some other part of the country or making sure that people get uh, uh, rice free and all, everything that he does is with that intent of saying, I should ameliorate suffering because a human being should feel strongly and deeply for it and feel one with that suffering and take care of it. I think that is what uh, I mentioned and that was his second birth in the, in the Mark Twain's words and that's the discovery of his purpose. Such a beautiful... Uh, um, one last, shall I do? Yes. Yeah. When it is a nation, uh, you say, uh, like India, which has to be inspired, to be made to believe in itself after it was made to feel inferior and slavish for decades of repeat, repeated colonization. Modiji has stressed the need for a uh, mental decolonization of our, our country and it is included in the pra Pancha Prana for uh, India Vision 2047. So, how does one rewrite something which has broken uh, an entire nation re you know work on it and bring us together and give us a sense of self and pride it's like uh, india losing the world cup in the final uh, match how do you he goes to the room and motivates the players how does one uh, fix a very broken nation no, it's not easy there are several routes to it i think we are attempting many of those routes in india today See, the whole problem of decolonization is, uh, several people have written extensively, Sai Deepak writes about it, everybody writes. So, decolonization is not just a word, it's a deeply held belief, a conviction, a mindset shift that we need. And it's not going to happen, whether it's the way we dress, the way we talk, like, uh, whether I like it or not, I have grown up on English, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I can, I can use English to help me decolonize. Or I can just use English to help me colonize myself better and hmm. further, right? It's, it's an intense sense of self-awareness we need to generate. I think what I have, I believe is his call is to look at it in several ways. Atmanirbhar is one way of looking at it. Garv is another way of taking pride. Ensuring that we don't have poverty is another way. Hmm. Ensuring that the social equity in the society is another way. Ensuring what India should represent itself as globally and making ourselves visible. 
Now, he has done every one of these things and I will give some few examples for that. Whether it is a national education policy which is relooking at it because that shapes the next generation like you cannot change me now. Mm -hmm. I have had the education I have so I cannot go back but I can acquire more education using the tools I have today. But my next generation can be brought up in that traditional thinking. It is not see tradition is not uh, we cannot romanticize tradition and say everything is great but we have to contextually make it relevant. So decolonization is about understanding cultural appropriateness. It is about understanding contextual relevance, it is about understanding signals and symbols of decolonization, it is understanding the DNA that leads you to take pride. It is something like what Swami Vivekananda said, he said that a, a child in India gets a high school education, I also mentioned that quote here, feels that India is useless, everything about India is bad. He might have said it 100 years ago, so we have to get out of that mindset today. So it is about creating and crafting a narrative which talks about what can be celebrated, there is so much to be celebrated. So when Prime Minister says, let us go back to our heritage sites. When he says G20 should happen in 200 locations across India and all the heritage sites, whether it is Mahabalipuram or whether it is Mysore, something which we can look back and say, wow, mm -hmm. if you look at the uh, 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 Chola temple at Tanjavur and, and you really are fascinated, look at Konark, look at all this. So, when you hold a G20 meeting in these places, you are not only visibly appreciating it, the world is appreciating it and you are appreciating the world appreciating it. <laughs> Right? Yeah. It is a sense of honor. honor. Yeah. When he travels abroad and the way the diaspora is, uh, the spark in them is yeah. kindled is one aspect of it. You know, the Madison uh, uh, meeting of his is all valued but what, he, what we do not see is in every journey he tries to bring back two or three artifacts back. Like Varanasi, the Annapurna statue that has been reinstalled yeah. is something which is smuggled out out of India and bringing it back is just a matter of pride. Yeah. So, at every level you try to make a cultural a culturally important thing. So, he has had this unusual ability of creating cultural pride, scientific pride. Today, we are talking of uh, quantum computing to putting up semiconductor labs to uh, green space. hydrogen to space economy to blue economy. So, we are not losing sight of the modern. At the same time, we, are, we are want to strengthen the civilizational context. We do not talk of Bharatiya Bhashas. In the work I do, at the Capacity Building Commission, we have built what is called the Karmiyogi Competency Model, driven completely by the civilizational thinking. The Char Sankalps we are saying is uh, because uh, Garv, Garv includes the decolonization, we are, we are looking at that institutionally, not just slogan wise. We are talking of uh, Kartavya, that what India is famous for, not rights alone, but responsibilities and Ekta, for which we say you need four gunas. So, everything that we are doing, it is a packaging in every angle. So, Prime Minister, I think, is a systems thinker. And from the systems thinking point of view, he talks of panch prana or decolonization. You can't take one piece out and say it will all get attained. You got to put it all together. And when all of us have to work together for that. That's why he says Samad Sarkar Bazar. It can't be in isolation because decolonization has hit all of us. We need to take pride in what we as a nation can do in every small thing, whether it's business, industry, trade, governance, to uh, cooking, to something else. Even cuisinary diplomacy, which he talks about, not that uh, Indian food should be globally known, yeah. makes it, I mean, we take pride. I remember 20, 30 years ago when I used to travel abroad and talk, stay in families or homes of Indians, there's children who not take Indian food to the school because hmm. they would tell their mothers, no, my friends make fun of me. Today, people uh, stand in line to enter Indian restaurants, right? That's the shift. So, that's also decolonization. Hmm. So, I think it's a package, it's multiple dimensions. And more importantly, it is a way of thinking, living and uh, immersing ourselves in the Indic life. Thank you so much, sir. It is so inspirational. Thank and uh, I think apart from reading the book, all of us should try to see, uh, seek the power within us and uh, make our own uh, small contributions to this great nation. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you so you much, Varadi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Namaste.